Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode, episode number five of Footprints. I'm Mr. Davis. I'm a leadership teacher here at BHS. And joining me today are two of my favorite rock star teachers from the history department. To my right would be Brandon Souza, and to my left would be Sam Stanchel. Uh, Brandon has been teaching for seven years, uh, and he's been here for four years. Mr. Stanchel's been here since 2009, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Time flies. Yes, it does <laughs> indeed. And uh, Mr. Stanchel uh, went to Westfield State, uh, had a double major in elementary and ed and history, has a master's from Salem State, which is now Salem University, I believe, no. right? Um, and has taught like U.S. 1 and U.S. 2, U.S. history, that is, regular world and AP, regular psych, hello, <laughs> AP psychology and also criminal justice. A whole lot of stuff going on there. Um, and so we like that. But what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to get to know who they are as individuals and who left a footprint on them, right, and why they do what they do. So first question to... Um, Brandon. I'm ready. Mr. Souza, he's ready. <laughs> All right, first question. Mr. Souza, why is it that you enjoy teaching so much? I really enjoy teaching, particularly at the high school level, because I feel like this is the moment when people become who they're going to be for the rest of their lives. They find their passion, they find their niche, they find their interest. And being able to witness that is such a pleasure and it really it's an honor to be able to to be a small part of that process yeah i hear that i do enjoy that as well mr stanchel same question to you why do you enjoy teaching so much uh for me it's all for the most part it's always been about relationships and um i found out you know earlier in my life that i really enjoyed working with um initially it started off the reason my initial degree was in elementary is because i worked to the recreation department with um first and second grade kids and I just loved watching them grow and learn, and I had such great uh, memories of that that when I went to school, it seemed obvious that, that you know, I, I really enjoyed the process of being a part of those um, growing moments for kids. Um, and then I found out via that experience that while I loved recreationally that age group, uh, the organizational focus didn't really match up with mine. <laughs> and of neither course. did, uh, you know, the... the um, desire for you know historical conversation you know right. believe it or not first and second graders not really too deep into the roman empire or, you know yeah the, those kinds of things <laughs> i can see how that would be a, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of a but, stick uh, in the mud there but even though the the age has changed i think that the 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 motivation is the same i love being a part of that that growing that learning mm -hmm. um and and helping to facilitate that particularly as someone who kind of every time i see something happen for a student i kind of think back to when it happened to me. Mm. Um, and it really kind of inspires me to continue moving towards those moments. Definitely. You always have those epiphany moments where it's like, boom, oh, wow, I got that. You know, I get it. And then you love it when your students have the same thing, mm. right, when it happens for them. It's always a good thing. Um, Mr. Sousa, do you have any siblings? I do. I have an older brother, Dan. Okay. And he, what does he do for a living? Does he do anything fun like you? <laughs> he works uh, with an insurance company. He uh, does like calls and that sort of thing. So um, okay. I think I, I'm biased, but I think I have the more fun job. Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I asked, did you do anything fun? All right. I know that uh, Mr. Stanchel here is one of four brothers. Wow. So tell us how that was growing up. Uh, well, you know, the, the psychology teacher in me wants to really pick apart and go too deep into this conversation. But, uh, <laughs> I'll keep it at the surface level. Uh, I'm the third of the four, and uh, I, I have I'm very, very lucky looking back on my life, and I'm very, very close with all of my brothers, which is wonderful. Uh, however, growing up, I think that, you know, that black sheep mentality mm -hmm. was, was real. I, I, you know, <laughs> my other brother who teaches here at the school with me, I remember we're two years apart, and um, I rarely spoke to him through all of high school. Like, you just, you know, that relationship wasn't really there, like, yeah. very close young. And then as all the social issues come about, sure. you're figuring out all that stuff. And, you know, um, I was always looking for, you know, that attention that the third child wants, you know, because, <laughs> you know, you got to spread it out in the families. But um, I can't speak highly enough of how, how much having them in my life inspired and impacted me mm -hmm. um, and really pushed me in a lot of ways to build a lot of the skills that are helpful in the classroom because 
you need to be able to speak your mind and you need to be able to be boisterous and you need to be able to, you know, command attention when Absolutely. needed. Um, and all of those I can, you know, clearly tie back to the relationships that I built with them. Um, but yeah, very, very blessed. I love that. So um, I'm, I have two brothers myself. Uh, so there's three of us, you know, I have an older brother, Mark, who is awesome. Um, and uh, a younger brother, Terrence, who is equally awesome. Um, <laughs> But one thing that uh, I, I share with them, and this is really awesome, is that our parents were always there at all of our sporting events. Mm -hmm. And I think that giving the, the, your child a gift like that, that you're always going to be there for them no matter what. Because I have, like, teammates that didn't have guys, no, no parents showing up, no, nobody there. And my parents were always there. And I asked my dad one day, I said, listen... Dad, why are you at everybody's sporting events? Like, you're at Mark's, you're at mine, you're at Terrence's. What, what, what's this? Why? He goes, Tony, if it's important to you, it's important to us. And I was like, wow. I was blown away by that. I was a junior in high school when he said that to me. And so that really impacted me. And that left the footprint on me. That's what my parents did for me. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I'm going to do that when I have kids. By the way, I have seven kids, in case you don't know. Uh, I have four boys and three girls. My oldest daughter, Caitlin, is 38. My youngest son, Ashton, just graduated from Gloucester High School last year. He's going to be 19 next month. So anyway, getting back to this, because I think this is really important, seeing how we're kind of interacting. You guys have any pets, by any way? Do you have any I don't pets? have a pet, yeah. No? I would love one, but uh, yeah. my, my apartment doesn't allow it. So. Okay, all right, <laughs> so yet. no pets for Mr. Sousa. What about you? Not at the moment. I grew up with uh, a multitude, a plethora, if I may, um, cats and dogs all the time. Um, but we're at a moment in my life where I have a very small child, and we're still figuring out the, how that relationship's going to go. But uh, So perhaps in the future, but not at the moment. Okay, yeah, well, guess what? I don't have any pets either. Uh, my wife is a cat person, but I'm a dog guy, so we're kind of clashing right there. So yeah. it's all good, you know. I love pets. We'll figure that out one day, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, this question is for both of you. So how do you guys kind of incorporate, say, technology and modern resources into your history lessons to engage the students? How do you do that? You first, Mr. Susan. That's an interesting question. I'm also stealing this from Mr. Stanchel because you mentioned this before the show and also based on where we are. But um, <laughs> I always, when I do projects, I give students lots of choices as to how they want to present information. Mm -hmm. So when I did a recent project on uh, the age of revolution, students had to basically teach their classmates about a revolution. Um, and they have many different options, particularly technological options to choose from. And several students chose to do a podcast. Um, so hearing the variety of podcasts was really interesting. So I had one student last year who interviewed her French teacher because he's from Haiti. And so she asked How a bunch of questions that? about the Haitian Revolution. Yeah. So that was perfect. Yeah. And this year I had students do a really creative podcast where they it was almost sci-fi-ish where they imagined that they brought back someone from the Mexican War of Independence, brought them into the future to do a podcast with them and then sent them back. Um, so that was a really unique way cool. to do that. Yeah, so right. I think allowing students to use the technology that they know and that they care about to show their learning is a really good way of engaging them. Absolutely. Well, same question to you, sir. What do you think? How do you use technology? Um, well, yeah, I think it's one of the issues that we have to deal with more and more nowadays because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it's total aside. Um, but... In terms of what we use right now, there's all the standard protocols, and I like to offer those. And like Mr. Souza said, I think one of the best things that I've been able to do is offer wiggle room. So when you're setting up or giving a project, um, giving the options, you know, kind of the standard protocol ones you might see, and, mm -hmm. then, and then end offering, and I think the best ones I've gotten in terms of creativity over the course of, you know, the last decade are the ones where a student will say, well, Mr. Stanchel, I saw in the directions that it said, or if you have another idea, come and speak to Mr. Stanchel. And uh, I've had some spectacular, I remember a kid recreated uh, the battle um, at, uh, goodness, the French and Indian War at the Forks of the Ohio in Minecraft. <laughs> wow. It was unbelievable. And, you know, obviously that's nothing that I would have thought of myself, right. but How then he came that? and it, you can apply those great new forms of technology into effectively getting across. And that's the other thing that you got to, you know, make sure that you're aware of is, mm -hmm. you know, kids going to use any excuse they can to play Minecraft instead of do a project. <laughs> but uh, so the, the monitoring needs to be there and there need to be some parameters. But um I can only echo what Mr. Souza said is that, you know, the, the myriad of different technological options that we have available to us now is 
um, wild. And I think that it only behooves us to really take advantage and offer those out to students uh, with the caveat that, you know, you're giving a little bit of guidance and not letting the, you know, the whole... <laughs> The, the what is it the carriage get ahead of the horse yeah, or sure. the phrase goes yeah but the creativity in that whole thing that whole sphere of kids getting involved with that is amazing to see what they come up with yeah. right and that's really where it's at we're kind of digging in and hopefully they're like you know what I'm gonna come up with this and this is gonna show what my creativity's like and by the way I'm gonna do it with a battle how great yeah. is that right. Yeah. You uh, mentioned to me in your notes and this is interesting because I, I, I couldn't <laughs> wait to ask this question. Uh, you said you lived in a castle in college. Yes, I think that's probably the most interesting fact about me. So. Yeah, please please explain. <laughs> I went to Brandeis University, which I absolutely adore, um, but Brandeis was founded in the 40s, and it replaced an older university called Middlesex University. And Middlesex University was founded by a kind of eccentric man uh, who decided that the university was going to be a castle. So he modeled <laughs> it after the style castles in Scotland and Ireland uh, and had it entirely built out of stone. Um, it was quite large, and that was the university. But when Brandeis took it over, they used it for a variety of different purposes, but ultimately decided that this was going to be sophomore dorms. So, <laughs> if, yep. <laughs> so if you were lucky enough, uh, you got to live in the castle. But when I lived in it, it was about 100 years old, and it had been used for a variety of different purposes, so it had been modified. So we had weird situations like, oh, there's this like ladder that goes up into the roof. I wonder what's up there. <laughs> or there's like these walls, and it turns out if you look inside of a gap, like there's a whole room in there that has like bookshelves. And it was it was like Hogwarts. It was the most quirky place I've ever been in, and I'm so lucky I had the opportunity to. Uh, how there. great is that, huh? For college <laughs> experience. I mean, I. I I don't know what to say about that one. <laughs> I mean, following that, that's unbelievable. Yeah. You know? That's so tremendous. Brand ice, everyone. <laughs> yes, for sure, for sure. You you also mentioned that uh, you you speak French Je and you studied French. you studied abroad in Paris. I did. How was that? Tell us a little bit about that. It was amazing. Uh, it was a great opportunity to, one, further hone my French-speaking skills, but also to really get to know uh, another place and another people. Um, because I think... Without intending to, we often have stereotypes about a lot of places and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to experience a place and a group of people yourself, you realize that the reality is so much more complicated. Like, I think a, a lot of Americans sometimes will say, like, oh, the French, they're not very welcoming. They can be standoffish. That was not the experience I had at all. I had multiple different French families open their doors to me. I was uh, one, just one example as I had the opportunity to stay for a week for free in a hotel in the town of Ilia Combray. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the innkeeper, you know, like made all my meals for me. We got to know the family. So like that is a great example of how welcoming and warm the French can be. Um, so it really was a great opportunity to really get to know a place and a people myself. Well, I, I, I have a confession to make. So I, I did take French in high school, but I got to be honest, I only took it because the French teacher was, you know, she was... <laughs> That's the only reason why I took it. I, I got to be honest. You know what I mean? Got to be honest. That's awesome. What an experience. What a what, what a way to 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 really like live your life and 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 find out exactly who and what you are yeah. by going and, and experiencing these things. Um, I want to ask you guys both: Who left a footprint on you, Mr. Stanchel, in terms of um, why you wanted to become a teacher? Uh, well, I mean, I can point to many different people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that I started working with kids in general, uh, growing up, I had such a great experience in our local recreation park program as a kid when I was in elementary school. Uh, I'd go down to our local park during the summer, and uh, the recreation department had staffed uh, counselors there to run programming. And one individual who actually is now the assistant director at the recreation department, uh, John Paydall, was my counselor. And uh, I've, I think that I've never been more impressed or, you know, just engaged by a person in my life and watching him in the way that he dealt with not only, um, you know, his fellow peers, but also the, the other kids at the park. Um, he inspired me to want to go into that work. And that kind of started the path. Um, the other kind of more obvious and clear cut ones are uh, being a, a official townie, not by any kind of <laughs> predetermined choice, but having grown up in Beverly and then come back to set up my life here and work here, is that uh, I have the great, great um, opportunity to now work with a lot of the teachers that I had as teachers in class. Mm. 
and um, you know a lot of the the great ones who who I've been able to kind of first see from the the desk side of things, right. and then see as a coworker uh, are spectacular. But I can uh, point to a couple to, just to kind of give credit where credits due. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mike Deering uh, has retired recently, but got to be one of my favorite history teachers of all time. He probably started me in this direction, um, but. Um, Trish Regan, I had um, just really changed my understanding of what a teacher could be. Hmm. I think that that we all kind of have those moments in our lives where you know teachers fit in this box and that's what they do, and then all of a sudden somebody will come around and you'll be like, oh wow, that's not at all what I expected, and you can do it this way. This is different, mm -hmm. and I kind of equivocated, you know, especially when you're, when you're working with younger kids. The first time you see a student out in the community at large, and they recognize that you are you and you're not. A teacher in the school building anymore you can kind of watch their brain explode um, <laughs> and I absolutely love that moment and I had that with so many different educators throughout just drastically changing my understanding of what it meant to teach and and you know impart wisdom and it wasn't just academia you know I think that right. was the biggest thing the teachers that really impacted me were the ones who took it far beyond the material that they were teaching and they made it human and they made it personable um, and relatable and I think that, again, that, that kind of connection that I got as from being a student initially mm -hmm. really kind of drives a lot of my pedagogy now. Nice. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why we have this, this Footprints podcast is because we want our students to see us in a little bit of a different light, right? We, we're in the classrooms, and we're into it, and we're given all kinds of material. But there's another side to us. We're human like everybody else. And we have a lot of things, although some kids would probably say teachers aren't human at all. But, you know, but we are. And so having, having said that, I have a question for you for maybe someone who's kind of getting into the game a little bit. Um, what advice would you give maybe to somebody who is aspiring to be like uh, a history teacher or just a teacher in general and they're just kind of starting their career? What advice would you give to them? Uh, I think I'd start with kind of embrace the mess. Honestly, it's, uh, the, the, one of the struggles that I think I've run into in general is just that things are changing so much faster than they ever have historically. And I don't want to make it a history thing because I, sometimes we can't stop ourselves. But uh, it's, it's, it's really impossible to kind of predict what's coming, yeah. and it, particularly in the short amount of time that is. And one of the things that I think that I went through when I first started teaching and I see a lot of early teachers come into is they're so concerned with getting it right right away and having it ready and doing it exactly how it's supposed to be done. And I think that that fear can really not ruin the experience, but it can certainly take it away or make yeah. it more anxiety prone yeah. than it needs to be. Absolutely. And to the po same point you were talking about where, you know, humanizing teachers to a certain extent, right. realizing that they're actual people, it's okay to tell your students that, hey, I don't know. You know, hey, I need to figure that out. Yeah. Like, hey, and to see that, I think, is a really, really important part of the process too and yeah. I think that I really struggled kind of with my pride when, when I was a young teacher is I don't ever want to admit that I don't know something you know? <laughs> and so I'd be more prone to be like you know straight face come up with my best guess and pass it off like no that's what it is you know? hey listen I have um, seven kids believe me I don't know a lot <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that would probably be my 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 first piece of advice absolutely so. So, uh, Mr. Sousa, who left a footprint on you, and why do you do what you do? Yeah, so I think, I always feel like I wanted to be a teacher, so that has been sort of enduring, but how I decided to become a history teacher was very inspired by a teacher I had in high school named Joe Early, um, who was both my Honors Global Studies teacher and my AP European History teacher, and what really drew me to him and, and how he inspired me was just his passion for the subject. Mm. We are, I think, very different teachers. He was very traditional, like a lot of lecture and, and tests and essays and that sort of thing. And I do things slightly differently. But even though that was his approach, he had such enthusiasm do it, in doing mm. it. And for example, when he would lecture, he would like act out what the historical figures would be doing <laughs> or saying. And that was just so entertaining for me to watch. So I think... Right. That passion piece uh, is really what inspired me. I think enthusiasm is contagious. So oh, yeah. seeing someone who is so enthusiastic about what he's doing really made me want to do the same. Oh, for sure. For sure. It always makes you. I mean, one of the things that I love about, you know, being in this profession is I was a, a young guy in middle school and I took home economics and I took cooking and sewing. And I had a bunch of my friends make fun of me. Oh, you're cooking and sewing. I'm like, yeah, but I'm in here. Look at who I'm in here with. I'm in here with a bunch of girls. You guys are going over there. So, and that teacher, though, was amazing. 
she really inspired me. So I, I got so inspired that I went home. I started like like drawing up these different designs. My mother bought me like a Singer sewing machine. She thought I was going to be the next guy that was going to come up with all these different designs. And I was making like you know daishiki shirts for my brothers and <laughs> sisters and all this stuff. And awesome. then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I want to play football. You know what I mean? My 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 it just shifted completely, right? But I had that interest initially sparked by a teacher, and that's the best part of what we do. Hopefully, we're sparking some interest with our students, and they're able to take that spark and, and maybe ignite something in themselves if they want to figure out what they want to do. Okay. Um, so this is a, a a good question. I was thinking about this. Um, how do you guys kind of stay up to date uh, with some of the latest sort of historical research and findings, and, and how do you kind of integrate that into the curriculum? How do you weave that in there? How do you do that? Yeah, so that, that's a fantastic question. And I think the biggest thing that's sort of in the history field, because, again, you know, history, sometimes it doesn't change, but sometimes it does. And I think what does change is how we approach talking about history. Mm -hmm. And I think in recent years, the biggest change that has happened is we have really been questioning for example, in world history, like, are we teaching things from a truly global perspective? Mm. Are we teaching, you know, are we actually teaching a European history course and pretending it's world history? Or are we actually doing our due diligence and teaching about the rest of the world? Right. Um, so I think that is something that has really been the focus of uh, really what, you know, Mr. Santo and I have really spent a lot of time on in the past couple of years. Um, and a lot of that inspiration comes from, I think, teachers pushing each other to, to do better and to... Um, really uh, present as many stories as we possibly can, uh, but also there's some really great organization for history teachers that yeah. um, that will provide resources and offer guidance, like the Stanford History Education Group um, mm -hmm. and, and others as well. So. Yeah, for sure. Same question to you, sir. Yeah, uh, I think that coupled with what Mr. Souza was talking about, I, I think that applying the skills that were really teaching to the students to what's happening modernly mm -hmm. also helps us to kind of delve deeper in there because I think something that I didn't really get a good sense of when I was a student in school is that we should be critical of the information that we're being given. Mm -hmm. that, was never a, that was never a principle that was taught right. to us. Um, and it, not just, you know, the materials that your teacher gives you to read, but I think about it all the time. I, I often challenge my students to, you know, critique me. Mm. Like, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Sure, I've learned about this topic and I've spent time researching it, but how many times have we learned through analysis of these other sources that the resources that we got are Eurocentric or right. we're only hearing a part of the story mm -hmm. or we're limited in our access because this one group decided this other group shouldn't be heard historically, so they burned all of their resources. <laughs> right? You right. know, we only have what we have so far. And, and so what that means is we need to adapt and be more critical about the information that we have. Um, and I think that we also get to see a little microcosm of that with what's hat playing out across the country. Mm. You know, pick your, your issue that's going on right now. Yeah, and for sure. ideally, I think that, that um, as Mr. Souza said, it, if you can really connect with the material that kids are hearing about now, you know, mm. like ask a kid what's the last thing they saw on TikTok. You know, start mm. there. <laughs> see if you can reverse engineer <laughs> that video they saw of, you know, the Palestinian, you know, um, um, protests that are going on in colleges and you know like can we get some perspective on this mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. because depending on who you hear you know they're going to tell you one version of that right and so understanding the importance of a diversity of resources and understanding that and oftentimes we're limited in our understanding by not being critical of the information that we have um is i think kind of hopefully the next step right. for a lot of students um for sure. understand the basics but then understanding the flaws of the system as well no doubt. So what I say all the time, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I say with history, you got to know where you've been in order to know where you're going, yep. right? Because sometimes it repeats itself mm -hmm. a lot, all through society, all through different, you know, factions of it. it. It always happens. So what's interesting to me is that as we're discussing this, we all have this like-mindedness of we want our students to really delve into it and enjoy it, mm -hmm. Right. And as they enjoy it, they discover, hey, maybe I might want to do that one day, right? Maybe I might want to be a history teacher. Or maybe Mr. Stanchel said something that inspired me to, that, that sparked to get to maybe go do what I'm going to do now, right? So that's really where it's at. 
And those footprints that you're placing on your students have a huge impact on shaping the world, right? So I, I liken it to like this. Steve Jobs was a guy who didn't even graduate college, went to Regis College, dropped out, then he dropped back in. And he dropped in on, on courses that he actually really wanted to, to learn about. And so one of the courses he dropped in was typography or calligraphy or something like that. And oddly enough, it was used in the first Mac that he, he produced. Now, here's a guy who started a company from his garage, right, with a buddy of his, and then he built it into a $4 billion industry, right? So now we have Mac. But he left his footprint, leaving that now us with something like this, an actual MacBook, something that we can use as, as a resource, right? The thing I like about Steve is he always was very candid, and he always said, you know, don't get bogged down by dogma, live in somebody else's life. Always make sure that you're true to yourself and, you know, do what you want to do in your life. Because at the end of the day, it's your life and you've got to decide exactly how it's going to be lived. And so one of the things that inspired me is that, that inspirational speech he had where he said, I'm going to tell you three stories about my life. And the last one he talked about was dying, which was interesting because he's like, we're all going to die eventually. So you should not be like embarrassed and to, to do that particular project that you want to do that's on your mind because guess what? It doesn't matter in the end because eventually at one point we're not going to be here, but how will you be remembered? That's the most important aspect of footprints and actually doing something relevant to push it forward for someone else. So that's basically what, what this is. And this roundtable discussion has been fantastic. I've enjoyed Mr. Brandon Souza and Mr. Sam, Sam Stancil. Excuse me. I need a glass of water. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been great. Uh, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to tune into Channel 22. I believe that's where we are uh, for BevCam. It's also on um, SoundCloud. You can catch us there. And I want you next week to tune into my to, to this show. It'll be uh, number six. Wait till you see who I have coming on here next week. You'll just <laughs> you're gonna love it. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have a nice roundtable discussion and find out who left a footprint on that particular guest coming up next week. Again, thank you, fellas. I appreciate you. You've been wonderful, and it's been awesome. And uh, let's do this again sometime. Yeah. All right. Thank, yeah. you. Yeah. thank you. Absolutely. So yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.